Hi, my name is Nathan. You're watching Nice at Dice, and today I'm taking a look at this game, Space Marine Adventures Labyrinth of the Necrons. Now, this is set in the Warhammer 40,000 universe, or Warhammer 40k as it's often abbreviated. Uh, it's basically this far future, very grim, dark kind of sci-fi universe. And this game is basically a very simple dungeon crawler style game. Uh, you take four heroes into this labyrinth, trying to complete a number of objectives, beat a big boss at the end, and it's a fully cooperative game for one to four players. I'm going to show you a little bit more of how the game works, and then we'll come back here and I'll give you my thoughts on it. But like I said, this is a cooperative game for one to four players. Uh, you are going to be bringing the heroes, uh, the space marines, through this labyrinth. These are your space marine characters. They each have uh, a miniature that represents them. The miniatures are really nice, really good quality. Just point that out to start with. Uh, there's four of them. There's actually five different heroes. You can only use four of them in a game. Uh, and the basic difference between a one player uh, or more is that uh, in a single player game, you're going to control all four heroes. And then as you add more players, you just divide the heroes up between the players, however you like. So uh, in, in a two player game, each player would get two heroes, etc. Uh, you have a reference card for each of these heroes that gives you some information about them. Here you have their symbol, uh, which is going to be important because those symbols are in the uh, initiative deck, which I'll explain in a minute. They're going to have uh, their range stat, their actions, and a special ability that they have um, called their war gear. So for example, this character uh, adds one to a dice roll made uh, when he attacks a Necron in a square adjacent to him. Necrons are the bad guys in this scenario. Okay. Uh, they all have different special abilities, but each one has one special ability and those stats that I just showed you. So basically, uh, what you're going to do is you're you're trying to navigate through this little bit of a maze to this spot right here, which is a computer console. You're trying to activate the computer console, and then you're going to escape. So I'll kind of take you through a single round of the game to kind of show you how it works. It's really fast-paced. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to draw a card from this deck right here. This is the initiative deck, and this card is just going to give you a symbol. So right away we have this symbol. Um, you can see that's on this character's data card. So that is uh, this gray guy. So he is the first one who's going to activate. All right, so he's going to activate. He's going to be able to take four actions. That's what it says on his data card. So he can use one action to move one space. Uh, you can move into a space that one of your allies occupies, but you can't stop there. So he can use two actions to move to the other side of that guy. That'll put him adjacent to this guy. His special thing is each turn he can make one attack um, against an adjacent enemy for free, as a free action. So he'll use his free action to attack this guy. So you can see the enemies are just these little pawns um, with a symbol or uh, an illustration of the enemy on it. Um, there are two different types of enemies in the first level. Um, you have these guys, which are the Necron Warriors, and then you have these guys, which are the Necron Immortals. The really only difference between them is the number that you're aiming for when you attack them. So on the Warriors, you just got to get a 3 or better, and on the Immortals, you got to get a 4 or better. All right, so we're going to roll this die to see if we hit. We're just trying to get uh, a 3 or better, and we rolled 2, so that's a miss. So his free attack was a miss. He still has two actions, though, so we'll use one of those actions to make an attack. And we rolled a 3 or better, so we get rid of this guy. He's going to go into this little velvet uh, bag over here. Uh, not really velvet. It's like a, a light canvas. Anyway, he's going to go in the bag. We took him out. We have one action left. We uh, don't want to move on to this spot. This is a spawn uh, space. That's uh, a little dangerous to stand on them. So we'll just have him stop where he's at. That'll be his action. Or actually, let's see. Maybe we can sh shoot at this guy. He's kind of around a corner. Yeah, I think the wall would be in the way, so we can't really shoot at him. So you can shoot at people within uh, the range of your character. This guy has a range of six, so this guy's within range. But you also have to be able to draw uh, a line from the center of your square to the center of the square you're shooting at without passing through one of these dark spaces, um, which are the walls. So kind of a close call there, but I think it would probably be blocking my line of sight. So we'll just have him stop there. Now we're going to draw the next card from the initiative deck. Okay, you can see that symbol is here on this guy's card. So that is this blue guy here. He's got four actions, so he'll go one, two, three. And now he can take a shot at him because he can shoot around that corner at him. Um, 
Yeah, that's not blocking his line of sight, and his range is four. He's within four spaces, so we'll go ahead and make that roll. All right, we rolled a five. That's definitely a hit on this guy. He goes back in the bag. And um, let's see, that was one, two, three, and then four for the attack. So, all right. So now this is the symbol of the Necrons. The Necrons are the bad guys. Um, so now we're going to draw a card from this. This is called the Labyrinth deck, and we'll see what the bad guys are going to do. This card is telling me to place a Necron minion counter on translocation square four. So the translocation squares are, like I said, they're basically the spawn points. Um, they're all numbered, so you can see like this one's number two, this one's number four. We're putting a bad guy on number four. Now there's already a bad guy on number four, so what we're going to do, we're actually going to pull two of these out um, and put one on either side of him, all right? So there we go, and then on to the next uh, turn. So now it's the yellow guy's turn. He's got three actions. We'll go one, two, three, stop there. And now the bad guys again, so we flip over another one of these. Basically same thing, except now we're spawning on number one. So here's where it would have been bad if I had stopped one of my guys on number one, because if you go to spawn an enemy on a spot and there's a guy standing there, you don't spawn the enemy, but you just wound the guy. So uh, wounding the guy means you flip over his card like this. Now it says he's wounded. Nothing else changes about his stats or anything. He's just wounded. And then if a character is already wounded and they would get wounded again, then you uh, remove them from the game. All right. You have to have at least uh, two people survive for it to be considered a tie. And you have to have at least three people survive for it to be considered a win. Okay. So anyway, we spawn that guy there. You can see this guy is one of these uh, immortals, the slightly tougher enemies. So that's going to be a bit of a challenge moving forward. Bad guys get to go again. All right, they're going to spawn on six, which is over here. It's already a guy there. So we'll just put one above and below there like so. Next up is the yellow guy. All right, so the yellow guy has a line of sight to this guy. He can shoot through his allies, right? We just assume that his allies are ducking or otherwise getting out of the way of his gun. Um, and he's within range. The, uh, the yellow guy has a range of eight, so he can shoot pretty much anywhere on the board as long as he can see it. So he's got three actions. He's going to go ahead and attack this guy right away. I'm um, just trying to get a four or better, except actually the yellow guy's special ability says that he can add one to the roll uh, when he attacks a Necron, unless that Necron is in the square adjacent to him. So not adjacent, therefore I get to add one, therefore I only have to roll a three or better. So uh, we rolled a two, so that's a miss. That was just his first action, second action. Goes again, whoop, rolled a one. All right, third and final action, uh, two. All right, three misses in a row. All right, bad luck for the yellow guy. Let's go ahead and do our next one, it's green, okay. So now green has a range of three. He's got the shortest range of anyone. Um, one, two, three. He'd have to move up at least one spot to have this guy in range. So now he does, and he's got line of sight. Again, he can shoot through his allies there. So he's used one action to move. Second action will be to attack. Rolled a two, that's a miss. And he can make one more attack. Let's see. Rolled a one, that's a miss. All right, lots of low rolls. Uh, let's see. Up next is the gray guy. So again, the gray guy gets a free attack against an adjacent enemy. All right, he rolled a four. That'll take him out. Nice. And he's got um, three more actions. So let's go uh, one, two, have him stop here, and he can shoot around the corner at that guy for his last action. All right, he rolled a four. That'll take him. So there we go. And now the bad guys are going to go again. All right, now they're spawning on five and six. Okay, so let's deal with five first. There's already a guy on five, so we're going to put three new guys around it. And then on six, again, there's already someone on six, and there's already someone above and below six, so we just spread out even further from there. All right, lots of enemies on the board now. Now the green guy gets to go again. He's got three actions. We'll use two of them to step up here. Um, again, I don't want him to stop on this spot, and he can't really shoot at anyone from where he's at, I don't think. It's kind of a close call with these corners, but I think it's probably probably too close to count. So that's it for him. Blue guy gets to go again, so let's see. He's got four actions. He'll go 
one, two, three, four. All right, getting closer to our objective there. That's basically it. That was the first round. So now we're going to shuffle up the initiative deck again and uh, start over from the top. The goal again is basically you got to get someone on this spot. And then once they're on that spot, they have to have an action, uh, use an action to try to activate the console. And you're trying to roll in a, a six in order to activate it. Once you've done that successfully, you have these three uh, gates right around the board. You're going to flip over all three of them and see which one becomes open. So now this is open. We're going to grab this little uh, stairwell section here. Going to add it to the board there. And now the goal, final goal, will be to get all of our guys into that stairwell. If I can do that, um, then the game ends with a victory for me. If at any point um, three of my guys are eliminated, then I've automatically lost. Or if I get to the end of this deck of Labyrinth cards and I have not gotten um, at least three of my guys, or at least two of my guys over here, then it's it's an automatic loss. All right, that's basically how it works. Now, there are three different levels you can play through. This is the first level. The second level adds um, some slightly tougher enemies uh, in addition to the ones that are used in the first level. It uses a different uh, Labyrinth deck, so some of the cards that come out of the Labyrinth deck will be a little more challenging. And it also adds like a little kind of mini boss character that you have to eliminate before you can activate the console. Then in the third level, you get rid of the console altogether, you ignore that, um, but you actually flip over that tile. And now um, it's a depiction of this character who's uh, kind of like the, uh, the main boss character. All right, so now you'll have this big boss character on the board and the goal is to go in, kill the boss character, and then one of the doors will open and you escape. That's basically how the game works. Let's go back up top and I'll give you my thoughts on it. So real quick, a couple of things that I didn't cover in that walkthrough. I didn't forget to mention um, that there's a deck of uh, these cards. These are called uh, special action cards. Um, it's a pretty sizable deck. And at the beginning of the game, you're supposed to deal, uh, I think, two per character. So basically eight, you deal out eight of them. And then uh, you pick one card for each uh, character to have. And these do a variety of things, right? So like you have uh, this card, which basically lets you recover a wounded character to their healthy side. You have this card, which is a frag grenade. Basically, it's a it's like a special attack that lets you hit one character, one enemy and in the enemies adjacent to them. Um, you have some that are specific to a specific hero. So when you draw these cards, you're only able to assign them to that specific hero. So like, for example, this one goes to the yellow hero. And it basically uh, lets you, you can play this at the beginning of his turn, and then he can't move on his turn, but for the duration of that turn, every time he rolls an attack, if the attack fails, you can re-roll it once, right? So different effects like that, okay? Um, also, I did mention, I think, that the game can be played as a campaign. Just quickly how that works is you can always set up any one of the three levels and just play through it, and that's the game. Or you can set up the uh, first level, uh, you play through it. Uh, once you've gotten you know, any number of your guys, um, as many as you can, onto that second stairwell, you kind of clear the board, um, except for your guys. You set up another, the second board, set up the second level on that board. Um, you carry over any of uh, these cards that you didn't use in the first level. Um, you deal out more of these cards like you do you know, at the beginning of the first level. And uh, if any of your guys are wounded, their wounded status carries over. And then you just play through the second level. Then you do the same process when you move on to the third level. Um, and then after you clear the third level, you win the whole campaign. So it does, um, that's, that is interesting. And if at some point between levels you have lost, like completely lost one of your heroes, you can bring in the fifth hero to replace them. Um, but you can only obviously do that once. So that is an interesting way to play it. Um, it is a little more challenging and uh, requires a little bit more strategic thinking, especially when it comes to the use of these uh, special action cards, because if you can hold on to it, the ones that you're dealt earlier in the campaign, then you have more options um, later in the campaign when things get more challenging. So that's interesting. Um, each 
uh, level is different, slightly different in its objectives. Each level also has a different uh, labyrinth deck, which provides slightly different challenges. And the game also provides um, a set of advanced cards, which um, basically explain how you link everything together as a campaign. And then they also give you a couple extra cards you can add to each of the labyrinth decks. Um, and those cards have slightly more um, challenging effects that um, come, you know, when you when that card gets played. And then they also have a couple of what they call challenge cards that you can play for each level. And those challenge cards are basically a, something that is in effect throughout the whole level, and it adds some additional challenge to the game. So that being said, the gameplay um, overall is pretty easy. Okay, the first time I played it, um, I just breezed through the first level. It was really simple. And then uh, I played through each of the three levels. Again, even the third one was fairly easy. So then I broke out those advanced cards. I threw all the advanced cards into the mix, played through a campaign with all that. And then it was a more interesting challenge, but still relatively on the easier side. Before I go too much into the gameplay and what I like and perhaps dislike about the gameplay, I want to talk about two other aspects of this. One is the setting and the other is the product itself. OK, so just briefly on the setting, I did another video of this game um, where I was actually played through an entire level. And I'll put the link uh, to that video in the description of this one if you want to go check it out. It's kind of a, a good way to maybe see a little more you know, detail of how the game is actually played. But in that video, somebody responded to it and they were not really offended, I don't think, but they were just saying, you know, like, oh, I hate to see you um, kind of make light of these characters, like the heroes and the enemies and whatever, because this is a really cool setting that all of this is coming from, okay? I'm not really familiar with the Warhammer 40k universe prior to making that video. Um, I was only just kind of familiar with, uh, like, I had vague impressions of it, basically. Um, after I got that comment, I was like, all right, let me look into this a little bit more. So I read up on the setting, especially on the Space Marines, who are the heroes here, and on the Necrons, who are the villains here. And I will say, after having done a little more research, that it is a very interesting uh, universe. Um, it's uh, very unique. It's, you know, that very, like, grim, dark, far future kind of thing. Um, I can definitely see the appeal of it. Um, it is very interesting. But I will just say that you know, it's really not, it's really not my thing. Um, it's, it's very like dark and hopeless and grim. And I prefer my fiction to be a little bit more, um, you know, light and, and optimistic, I guess. So those are my thoughts on the setting, basically. That being said, I think I enjoyed the game just fine, knowing very little about the setting. So if you don't know the Warhammer 40k universe, all right, I don't, you know, if you are familiar with it, you might get a little more out of the game, but I don't think that you're really um, going to feel like you're missing anything if you're not familiar with the universe and this is your first encounter with that universe in a game. All right. I think you can still enjoy this game as much as you would enjoy it um, without that familiarity with the universe. OK, so those are just kind of my thoughts on the theme and the setting and whatever. Um, but now the second thing I want to talk about is the as a product. I think this is interesting as a product because um, I tend to look, you know, a little bit. I, I don't dwell on it a lot, but I tend to look a little bit at like the components of a game. What's what's the production quality of the game? So the Warhammer 40k universe is primarily a tabletop miniatures war game, right? So you would expect that this game. Um, being set in the same universe, coming from the same company, would probably have some decent miniatures in it. And it does. I really like the miniatures in this game. It only has five miniatures to represent those five heroes. I think it would have been really cool to include um, a fifth or a sixth miniature for, like, the boss character. All right? It, they didn't, but that's okay. Um, you know, it would have been neat, but it's fine without that. It makes sense to me that the, the minor enemies don't have miniatures because A, that would be a lot of miniatures, and B, um, you have to pull them out of that bag without knowing what you're pulling out. So it makes sense that they're just those cardboard tokens, and I think that works fine. You know, but the miniatures are really good. Um, I'm used to buying board games that have plastic miniatures where the miniature is just like one solid piece of plastic. In this one, the miniatures are, um, they come in pieces and you have to put them together. So that's, that was different for me as someone who's primarily a board gamer. But it was fine. Um, the instructions were very clear on how to put them together. 
they fit together really nice. You just kind of push all the pieces together and they stick. You don't have to use glue or, you know, anything to, to make them work. So the miniatures are really good. The rest of the game, um, the production value, I would say is kind of low. It's definitely below average. The cards are thin. Um, the initiative cards, which is what gets shuffled the most, um, are already um, showing somewhere after, you know, just about, I think, 10 times that I've played the game. So there is that. It's not a big deal to me. I don't expect uh, any board game component to last forever. So uh, that's fine. But I think it's interesting because I think the reason why the production value on on a whole is kind of below average is because this really is a mass market game. And I understand with a mass market game, um, you're going to go first kind of lower quality so that you can produce a ton of them and sell them at a price that uh, would be acceptable for a place like uh, Target or Barnes & Noble, Target being the store that I bought this at. And I think that's really cool. I think it's cool that this is a mass market game. Um, because A, the setting, you know, Warhammer 40k, I know it's really popular among uh, its fandom, but really it's it's no Star Wars, it's not even as popular as Doctor Who, I don't think, you know, so it's not a universe that the general public is really acquainted with. So the fact that someone could walk into a Target, this might catch their eye, they pick it up and play it, and then be introduced to the Warhammer 40k universe, and by extension, perhaps just the whole uh, tabletop miniatures wargaming hobby, which again is a hobby that it has its fandom, but I think there's probably millions of people who are not even aware that that exists as a hobby. So the fact that someone could walk into, you know, like a big box retail chain store and pick this up and be introduced to all of that, I think is really cool. Uh, I think it's also neat that they could, um, pick this up and be introduced to the, um, just the like the whole dungeon crawler genre of board games people who grew up like i did on monopoly and scrabble and maybe risk that's a whole genre of board games that they may not even know exists and so they could pick this up they could play it and be introduced to that as well so i think that's really cool um you know it's always a little disappointing when the production quality of something is below average but i think in this case it's actually a really cool thing that this is essentially a mass market game um, because of what it is and what it can introduce the general public to. So that is a really cool aspect of this. Now, having covered all that, let's go back to the gameplay itself and what I think about that. So first of all, uh, the coolest thing about this game, in my opinion, uh, is that initiative deck. I really love that mechanism. I've seen it in a few other games, and I always enjoy that mechanism. Basically, what it does is it makes it so you never know uh, whose turn is going to be next. It is some randomness, which some people may not like that randomness, but personally I think that's really cool, especially in a game that's relatively light, like this one is. It's not super critical that you be able to plan um, exactly, you know, who's going to do what when, all right? It's just kind of when it's your turn, you do what you think is best for your turn. But having that initiative deck work the way it does, it keeps some tension because you, you can never be 100% sure like, all right, is one of our guys going to go next or are the enemies going to get a turn in between us? You know, you don't know when that's going to happen. Um, also, it keeps you engaged uh, at every moment because whenever your turn comes up, you want to be ready for it and you don't know exactly when your turn is going to come up. So I think that's pretty cool. I also like just kind of the balance of it where there's two cards for each hero in that initiative deck. And then you have either four, five, or six uh, enemy cards in that initiative deck, depending on how difficult you want um, the game to be. So that's kind of neat, knowing that like every round you're going to get two turns, and then that's going to be intermixed with everyone else's turns and the enemy's turns. So I really like that particular mechanism. Apart from that, it's a really simple game. It plays really quick. It's quick to set up, quick to put away. So I like all of that. Dungeon crawling games are generally fairly complex. Um, there's a lot involved in setting them up and playing them, putting them back away. It can be like a whole evening's um, activity to play a dungeon crawler. This is probably the only dungeon crawler I've played where you can set it up, you can play it, you can put it all away in like an hour tops. All right. If you play the full campaign, it's going to stretch that out maybe like two and a half hours, I would say, probably something like that. But uh, if you just want to play through one level, 
our easy top. So I think that is really cool, really um, puts it in an interesting niche of its own. So I like that. The gameplay overall is fairly simple. And again, I think that's cool, especially as an introductory game. But I will say that because it's so simple, uh, there's not a lot of room to explore different strategies or tactics. Um, the different levels add some variety in terms of what your objectives are and the types of challenges that are going to be coming out of that Labyrinth deck. But really, after you've played through every level and maybe played through the campaign, for me anyway, I feel like I've kind of seen everything that the game has to offer. So I've played it about 10 times, and I don't think I feel exceptionally inclined to play it again, right? If somebody else had the game and they were like, hey, you want to play Space Marine Adventures? I'd be like, sure, it's a fun game, why not? But it's not a game I'm going to pull out to play solo, and it's not a game I would really bring to a group, you know, to ask to play. Now that being said, I bought this game on sale for about half price, and so I feel like I really got my money's worth uh, playing it 10 times, you know? So I don't feel bad about that. I'm going to pass it on to someone else for them to enjoy, and I, I feel pretty good about that investment. Now, whether or not you think that's a good investment um, at whatever price you find it at is up to you, but that's just my observation that while it's a fun game, it fills a really interesting niche, and, um, you know, it's it's a lot of fun to play. Uh, I do feel like it has kind of a limited um, number of plays in it, especially for experienced board gamers who have seen a lot of different board games. Uh, you're going to feel probably like after a few plays you've seen everything the game has to offer. So unless you're really captivated by what the game has to op offer, um, you're going to feel like you're going to burn out on it pretty quickly. All right, that's basically what I'm saying. Now, just an observation, if you do play the game and you want to get the best experience out of it. What I have found the most enjoyable is in this uh, deck of special action cards, there are two that are specific to the, the different heroes. Um, so I like to take those two cards out of the deck, give them to that hero to begin with, and then give them one random card um, out of like the generics, like they tell you to do. And then I like to take all of the uh, advanced cards and mix them in right away, okay? So the all the cards that basically up the challenge of the game, and uh, and then play the campaign. I think that's like the most interesting place um, as far as, you know, if you're experienced, especially if you're experienced with dungeon crawlers, all right, that's going to provide you a nice uh, balanced challenge, right? All the extra stuff from the advanced deck, um, from those advanced cards, right, are going to up the challenge. But giving yourself, giving each of your guys those couple of extra abilities is going to kind of cut, you know, cut the edge off of that a little bit bring it down to a place where it feels pretty fair. And also giving your characters those extra special abilities makes each of the character feel a little more unique. And it gives, gives you a little more of, um, you know, some strategic decisions to make. Because you have more abilities, but you can only use each of them once. So you're thinking a little bit more about when is the best time to use each of these abilities. So that's pretty cool. I will say also another thing I like about the game, while it is very simple, um, you are able to ramp up the difficulty. And especially when it comes to cooperative games, I actually do like cooperative games that start out easy and then have multiple ways to ramp up that difficulty. I think that's a really nice way to do it. It makes the game very approachable. So that is definitely a good thing about this game. So those are basically my thoughts about Space Marine Adventures. I do recommend it. It's a fun game. Just if you are really familiar with board games already, if you've played a lot, especially if you've played Dungeon Crawlers before, be aware that after, you know, maybe a dozen plays of this, you're going to have pretty much seen everything the game has to offer. And you may feel like um, it doesn't really beckon you to come back to it again. So kind of weigh that against whatever price you find it at and whether that's a good investment for you. But again, it's a good game. I think it's an excellent product. Um, and those are my thoughts on it. My name is Nathan. You're watching Nice at Dice. Thank you so much for watching and you enjoy the rest of your day.